Welcome to the J3 University Podcast. I am your host, John Jewett. And I am your co-host, Luke Miller. Our mission is to elevate the physique coaching standard. And deliver the highest level of competitors to the stage. Let's jump into today's episode. Don't you hate it when you buy a 3X shirt and your arms are just too tight in it? <laughs> I, I know, Luke's just like, smile at me. It's like, well, for, for most of us, this is not a problem. And this is why we're doing this episode, because if you have weak arms or maybe you have great arms and you just want them to be ridiculously even better, this is what we're talking about today. How to bring up arms, whether you need to do it, and then how to specialize your, your training cycle around it. We'll get into our favorite exercises, how we would make a split around it and enjoy. We're on the path to 21 inch arms now. Yeah. And I think, uh, it's a suitable podcast topic for myself because my arms were never the strongest body part on my physique. And it took a lot of tinkering to figure out how to get up to speed to the rest of my physique. So, um, for those of you who like to categorize physiques, I was definitely a torso dominant individual other than like my quads because they just seem to grow no matter what but yeah you make that sound like you're you're just you're just a waste a waste heavy individual no like i wasn't dominant no <laughs> torso just dominant like, that's how it sounds <laughs> back was good chest got, no, no, I got good you. the yeah. torso is neck neck to yeah 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 oh lord okay we're gonna get the wheel rolling here but um yeah, I think what- I, had a, I had a scare. I had a like a son of a scare about around arm training. The um, I had my push day mm. sun, Sunday, and I was doing laterals, and feel like this kind of weird thing in the front delt, like a little twinge at the top, goes away, not a problem. The entire rest of the workout. Then the next day, like I was like, man, my bicep is is tight, sore. Like this is strange. Then I'm like, I'm gonna like massage gun it. And I roll up my sleeve and there's like this, this faint, faint bruise there. I'm like, what in the world happened to me? And so I think I just tweaked my bicep a little bit on my push day. Pretty sure it was doing laterals. Oh, wow. Then, or it could have been the flies. Yeah, yeah. So, but it, it felt like up there in that, uh, that like, you know, origin point on like the, you know, coracoid process or something around there. Yeah. It, it uh. But fine, fine now today. So it's not a, I already had a pulled session. I had a push session. No hindrance looked like something like minor happened, but just, uh, I was like, man, if my bicep goes, then it's all over from here. <laughs> I think, I think a place I like to start with arm training is assessing the need because I don't know about you, but I get a lot of people who tell me arms are a weak point for them, but then you actually do like a physique breakdown of like every shot. And it's like, it may not be their strongest body part, but it's just not necessarily a weak body part. And they just feel self-conscious in their t-shirts when they're walking around and they just want bigger arms when they're kind of walking around their t-shirts. And I think that that's an important thing to kind of differentiate before we start getting into like, how do we actually address this issue? Because Assessing client need is such a huge part of any specialized training program. And I think arms is probably where it's missed most often because of that desire for these massive 22, 23 inch arms. So we all wanted when we first started training, right? Like yep. young guys, like just, just big arms. And then it is a, you know, in, in a t-shirt. Yeah, it, it looks, it looks cool, but around like, as coming up in bodybuilding, you have to truly assess like where, where do you stand physique wise? And you know, I would say if you need 10 plus pounds of stage weight, you likely shouldn't have an arm specialization cycle or That's be exactly where I was going. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like highly focused around it just because when we get into these training, training plans, like the, uh, you're going to have to dedicate potentially a whole day around arm training or even in, you know, say a pull session or push session, having that be more arm work, it's taken away from those, those big uh, body parts that can really fill up a lot of real estate on mm. the stage. Right. Yeah. Like you could, if you have a massive back and legs, like that's going to carry you much farther than just having massive arms and your legs kind of lack and your back lacks. Yep. W would you say Luke, that there is any discrepancy and differences for the requirements of arm size proportion 
between different division male let's say male divisions like physique versus classic versus bodybuilding yeah 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 i do um and i think it kind of goes in potentially descending order from bodybuilding down to physique as in highest need being physique kind of lowering in classic and then lowering further in bodybuilding and the reason i'm going to say that is because each pose is a higher percentage of your total score because you're getting less poses per class in physique and in classic than you are in bodybuilding. So my logic with that is like, when you look at classic, what are the shots you have? You have front double, massive exposure for arms, side chest, can hide it pretty well in a side chest. So I don't really count that as like a massive exposure. Back double, huge exposure for arms, ab and thigh, and then your most classic, which for most people, your favorite classic is some variation of a front double pull up or a front lat spread combined with a front double, like a T cut pose. And so like within classic for me, it's probably got so much more importance than in bodybuilding because I feel like you can out mass in other shots a little bit more than you can in classic. And then in physique, you got two shots, right? And when we look at like the classic requirements for men's physique, and people just like to simplify it, use like the beach boy standard. What's the first thing you look for? Small waist, big arms. And at least in men's physique, the shots are pretty much front on and directly from the back. So you don't have that side profile arm exposure to, to, to show like the full width. Like maybe you could get away with it. Yeah. More, you know, the, the physique guys I see that have really big arms, it doesn't fit right. It starts to look more like, honestly, bodybuilding to me, upper body wise. So, so would you say classic is the most highest need of all the classes? I think proportionately. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, especially if you just actually look back to 70s, 80s bodybuilding, like that really was the look. Like you had yeah. massive arms and these like really drastic tapers in, in bodybuilding. Not that it's not that. But you're right, there's there's a lot more shots and you just have to fill in more mass everywhere. Yep. So the the proportion it actually gets a bit more even as far as what you need development wise. But but from a size perspective, arms are, are much bigger on, on bodybuilders. Yep. So yeah, I would say like proportionally, yeah, Clifford for classic, you, you would need more arm and and maybe that's why, you know, Classic's really popular, especially with younger guys. So yep. you probably see a lot of guys wanting big arms because that is the look. But it still comes back to moving up progressively, physique-wise, and then getting more specialized as you need to. Mm -hmm. Because you very well could start training like in on, on like a good, you know, balanced overall training split and have good arm development along the way. Or, or maybe you are someone that just skyrockets in arm development and you need to scale it back. So think you need that time earlier on spent with just a good overall balance program. Then as you get more advanced and you see that body parts lagging, then we start to specialize. Yeah. Which is what we should now get into. If you <laughs> really need to specialize, but just wait until you have enough size to do so. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think arms is an interesting one because the first red flags that come up for me are, Injury profiles, because the propensity for injury profiles within like elbow joints is really high, especially when that training frequency increases with arm specialization, because we're going to kind of cover the main characteristics of like what causes a program to be specialized towards one body part. But one of the biggest ones is frequency in which arms will be trained. And I see a lot of connective tissues issues once that frequency gets up because they're not taking into account the carryover into tricep with pressing and the carryover into bicep with pulling that is there. Even on like a hamstring day when you're hinging with through an RDL and you're hanging onto a bar, like that's going to be a lot of loading kind of through those joints to be able to hang onto a bar, even with straps. So we do need to be careful from a frequency standpoint because with the elbow joint being further away from the main hub, if you do have dysfunction, it's going to take a lot of a, of the brunt, whether it be like scapular dysfunction or, or anything. It's going to take a lot of brunt when it comes to like forces going in directions they're not supposed to go. Yeah, and so I think part of it before you just do more, right, is probably do better quality yep. if you're not already. Mm. And it 
I mean, I feel like this will be a, a self-explanatory one, but like just the arm musculature that we need to even focus on. Right. Um, mm. Biceps, obviously. Yeah. Um, flexes the elbow, the short head crosses the, sh the shoulder joint a little bit more. So it does aid in some shoulder flexion. So yep. we should have some movements that have, you know, a curl by the side, maybe a curl overhead. You might have a curl that has more of a neutral hand grip to hit the brachialis, mm -hmm. which is the muscle lace underneath the bicep, brachial radialis on the forearm. I think that fully covers it. I don't really do reverse curls much. Then uh, the triceps. So lateral head, media head, long head extends the elbow. And we have that long head also crossing on, onto the scapula. So it does aid in some shoulder extension and we can get it also fully stretched going overhead. So like the bicep, we should have tricep movements that train the elbow down at the torso and also overhead. And where we find issues around this is that in all these different movement planes you have to get into train is that you're making, uh, forcing yourself to fit into a machine. Mm. And that can usually make a, a hinge joint like the elbow get bound up with lateral forces moving through it. Exactly. So just think like if you're like, what are y'all even talking about lateral forces and stuff? <laughs> just think about, think about how your elbow feels when you do a skull crusher. Right. And it, it feels like there's a tension in like the side of the joint because you're not able to just move that joint naturally how it would. So in all these patterns, like a, a good kind of injury strategy is before you do any movement, a curl, extent, tricep extension, just stand there and see how you would curl without anything in your hand. And how you do that is how you should align yourself up with a dumbbell, a cable, a machine. And if that position doesn't allow you to do it, then find one that does. And this is why you'll see like Luke and I using more dumbbells or cables mm -hmm. or single arm patterns. So we're able to align ourselves into the movement that is more biomechanically friendly for joints because like Luke is saying, the big bottleneck here is with high arm training frequencies that you'll get into connective tissue, fatigue, joints, elbows beat up, wrists beat up. Then you have to pull back and then that's taken away from progress. Yeah. And I think uh, just like the, the, ca the not caveat, the add on to that is once you've kind of figured out the single joint setups with like unilateral setups, I do like making sure every portion of the range is addressed, whether it be short and mid and lengthen across the sessions across the week. So if we're getting to the point where arm specialization is in play, I like it intra session covered. So like if you have that arm session where you're getting to do nine, 10, 11 sets of arms in that single session, you should be covering the full spectrum of loading shortened to mid to lengthened. And all that's going to be is going to be adjusting setups relative to where these biceps and triceps act. So obviously like an example would be lengthened position bicep would just be a standing cable curl that's behind you kind of extending that arm back and, and loading that length in position. So making sure you're doing something that's within the confines of your movement capacity for each portion of that range. Uh, what, what are your other movements? You, like what, what exercises would you have that would fully develop the arm? What, what would be your, what's your, what are your favorite ones? Yeah. So, I would typically start like, let's run bicep first. Cause I'll typically like my arm sessions. I do like alternating in fashion. So like bicep, tricep kind of back and forth. But if you're running through the bicep exercises first, I like a cable curl where you're facing it because you can adjust how much in the shortened position it is relative to how close you are to the cable. So if you're like right on top of the cable, it's probably going to hit you mid range the most. And the further you step back from it, the further it's going to be kind of addressing that shortened in range. Mid range is typically something like a, a dumbbell by your side because that force is going straight down. Dumbbell is going to load that mid range portion. And then length in position bicep is that standing incline cable curl with the cable behind me. Um, those are my three preferences. I will say I do make sure that a hammer curl is in the auxiliary session later in the week. And then I also make sure our preacher variation is somewhere in the auxiliary sessions later in the week. And so that's kind of how I organize it most of the time, depending on like personal preferences, uh, that would kind of be like my ideal setup bicep wise. Um, but how would you go about the bicep portion of it? Is that similar to kind of how you would set it up? 
Yeah, I mean, there's some there's variations that I I like within those, and there's not what like there's certain things about each one that I really like, and I kind of rotate through. Yeah, like to to get the bicep short. Like for one, I think if you're someone like man, I can't feel my bicep at all contract. Getting like a preacher curl, mm. you know, is great because it's braced. Like I know you mentioned doing the cable curl facing it, but again, like you kind of have a lot to stabilize and think about. So a preacher curl could be nice for, for, for someone that needs to like have more braced and really concentrate. Um, I think also cueing with that, like make sure you really cue like a lot of supination. Cause I see people that like, Oh, I just feel my forearm. And usually they have just a little bit too much of a neutral grip and not getting into that full mm. supination. But I do really like an overhead cable curl. Now it goes against what I just said about being like braced, but you can really get that bicep loaded short. And so if you don't feel like a bicep contraction, that can really make you do it. And it also is kind of like has a, has a shoulder functional aspect of having to stabilize the scapula with the shoulder overhead. Not a huge deal, but I think those two variations of loading the bicep short, I really like. My still favorite is just a single arm dumbbell curl for a mid range. Yeah, and I, I allow a little bit of shoulder flexion mm. to happen. I think I get the full range out, out of it that way. And then I like your other one, your last one, the the cable curl behind, behind the back. I, I used to do like incline bench dumbbell curls, but but man, like the beat you the, up. My 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 ability yeah, it was just my ability to get in that position really sucked. And some people can do them. And, uh, but once your dumbbells get big enough, they're like hitting you in the hips and like, <laughs> it just, it just doesn't, doesn't work well. So yeah, those, those would be a few good ones. So you could, yeah, you could have it to where you do two choices early in the week and the other two choices later in the week. Um, or you know, some people might just do one all in one day and then mm-hmm. load the other one the other day for a different range. But, um, how about, uh, and uh, yeah, and also I did mention like the hammer curl, which I just dumbbell hammer curls. Just yeah, same. Straightforward. I, I'll mess with cables every now and then, but it's kind of weird how the cable moves in your hand. So I uh, prefer for dumbbell. Yeah, I will say before we hop in the tricep, the overhead cable curl, I have a tendency to not program that as in a session and more as prep work. Prep work and activation than an actual movement within a session. Okay. Yeah, just because of of that instability and its value to me is more getting a bodybuilder into a position they don't typically have great access to. Um, It typically will be a part of the prep work for the arm day. Yeah, that's the only difference. Um, Triceps. So a lot of options here Um, because then you're going to start getting into dips and close grip as whether those are viable options within the tricep setup. Um, I know my opinion. What's yours? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think if you're going to do a press, have it still be focused around like chest. primarily chest or delt, you know, yep. um, Same. moving to a, like a, a, such a close grip where that, you know, that wrist translates in <sighs> most of the time it loads the wrist really poorly. And then also you're not getting a, you're not getting a ton of stretch out of the tricep with it. It's more like stacking joints of the wrist and, and the elbow. Yep. Um, and it's a lot of shoulder, actually, like how you move. Like the, the elbows usually tuck in. Um, so the moment arm's really, really long for the shoulder joint to have to produce a lot of torque there. And then you, you really, to load right um, with that wrist and elbow stacking, it actually doesn't bias the tricep a ton. So it's like a... I mean, it's just a, a poor press movement that limits output. It's okay. Like it'll, it'll, don't get me wrong. People have done it and it'll build triceps. But if you're someone that really struggles developing them, it, you might need something that is going to stretch those triceps out more. And also that press is just putting more volume and more fatigue into all these other muscle groups that you could limit. And if you really need to focus in peripherally, like, you know, partition more towards arms we should get something that's a little bit more biased for them and maybe more isolation based Mm. the same thing goes with dips like it's it's okay 
Uh, I see a lot of people just don't have the ranges to be able to get the tricep fully stretched. And the same thing, it's like you you have to keep the wrist and elbow stacked or <laughs> it would be extremely challenging. <laughs> it would be basically a, a push down, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's what you're turning it into. So, um, yeah, and, and that one, it still it loads the, the delt a lot. And then also some like pec minor and serratus yeah. and some lower pec fiber. So it's, it's easy to, if you're someone that has weak arms, move a lot with those other muscle groups that might be stronger body parts and you just will lack the stimulus on tricep. What would you, would you agree in that? Or, or do you still program some of those in close grip? Never. I don't want to say never, but no, um, not a big fan of the close grip bench just because of the carryover and everything else. I like a dip machine depending on the dip machine that's available because typically it locks them into a more vertical torso position and they can make it a little bit more tricep based. Um, with the body weight dip, a lot of times you just see that torso start to like tilt forward and then it turns more into a chest press than it does like an actual, actual tricep movement. But, um, I, I do like it dip. I will say I don't do it out of the gate though. So my preference would be again, starting short and single arm kind of back in here, where I'm getting that uh, humeral extension and something like a cross body. So you could do that bilateral and like a narrow cable stack where you have the cables crossing and you got your elbows tucked and you're going to that extension. I prefer that unilateral just because for me, I can align the cable well to that upper arm and really get that tricep shortened. And then I would go into a dip machine because I feel like I've already created that connection with tricep where they're a little bit less likely to kind of transfer that into other body parts. But that would be probably like my two out of the gate that I would start with. And then the third movement is based on how well they can tolerate overhead patterns. Because I really think that we need to expose bodybuilders to the length and position they can tolerate. And for most, that overhead is just too much. And so I will work someone to the overhead. So start in something that's kind of out in front of them a little bit more, kind of like a dumbbell JM or something like that. And then kind of start to expose them into like a higher end range for that last pattern in the length and position. Yeah, I, pr I program the same. Just maybe it's because I'm like older, but I've even done it when I, I was younger too because I just heard other guys say just start with the push downs first. Uh, so that's always been in, in place. But yeah, um, you could do them bilateral. Like it just depends on, on your ability to get in that position and what kind of attachments you have. Like I was mentioning earlier with the skull crusher, uh, a lot of guys to get fully the hand pronated and also keep the elbow in line with the cable, it usually starts to drift out. And then it, it becomes this like really poor, like internal rotation that happens at the end and you're having to kind of press it. And so single arm, a lot of time is what I go with for cables. Mm -hmm. Now I do have some females that like, Hey, if you're narrower and you have like something like a, a prime bar and some handles that have like good rotation to them could, can do a bilateral because I also get the, the time efficiency aspect around doing everything. Single arm takes <laughs> forever. So if you can do it, yeah, by all means do it. But if you really suck, and by the time you're probably pretty big, uh, you're probably advanced to where maybe you're putting more time in your arm training anyway. So this is where you could you could move to like the single arm type tricep extension. Yeah, I do like overhead cable work, but but varied based on what the ability is to get overhead. So if you get someone like I want to get the tricep as stretched and LinkedIn as much as possible. So that might be directly behind head. And with that cable, just kind of running like down right against the center of the back. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can't get there, then I'll have it run right over the tri the, the trap yeah. and doing kind of like this, a salute. I won't say what kind of salute, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, yeah, doing like um, a modified, like what are you, samurai sword pull? I don't know, whatever you'd call it. Um, and, and those will be, usually those two variations will work well for single arm, like cable yeah. work. Uh, I also, I used to really like Smith J impresses, but a after a few <sighs> weeks, it just messes Beat up your you wrist up. and the lo loading's a problem. So dumbbells have been a good one, but the issue with dumbbells is that once the dumbbells are big enough, it kind of limits range of motion, but it's kind of like, uh, some people might call them tape presses 
tape press used to be like you touch the dumbbells and as you're going down, you're rotating them together to your fist or like um, facing each other. Yeah. I do these just a little bit more spread out to where they like align with the shoulder and pressing like that, which it, it, it can fully stretch the, the tricep. It just depends for you mechanically um, how that lines up. You know, some people might be able to do just a bilateral tricep extension. Uh-huh. Again, it just depends if you can get in the position and, and keep that elbow pointing up to the ceiling. Um, but if, if not, if you find yourself start put it, pointing out towards the wall doing them, that's when you're probably going to incur some, some elbow stress. Yeah, and that's where, like, I start people out here in front of them for the structural stability and then work them up to see what they're capable of um, with with those kind of patterns. Now, the one we left out is, like, the generic overhand pushdown. Do you use it? Because oh. I like it with, like, an adjustable width bar. Like, something where you can attach the handles and choose how wide it is and kind of get into oh. that. Yeah, no, no, I, I was, uh, I, mean, I mentioned the, the bilateral pushdown with, like, a uh, time bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, an actual easy bar push down no. that I was saying is usually pretty crappy for for most people. Yeah. Um, even crappier would be the V bar handle. Yeah. Uh because at by the time you get to here, you're having to really try to move the hands back towards the hip, but it just doesn't allow that because you're in this little narrow bar. So you have to end up being a push down. Yep. Um and driving the elbows in like a press at the end, which you could do a lot more weight. Uh, but you're also bringing in more, more delt and pec and everything else to just turn it into a press. So, a lot, a lot of the like old attachments that we use for triceps just really aren't the best for triceps. But yeah, and I think what I, go ahead, go. Yeah, no, no. I think just to to fully encompass that, like have some type of tricep extension with the elbow down at the torso, like like a a push down variation have something that is overhead as much as you can get it, then still have all your pressing work take place. Mm-hmm. And that should fully encompass tricep development. I will move guys to like a little bit of a, a narrower press, uh, but not a close grip press. If like tricep is really, really the focus that way I just ensure we're getting as much elbow bend as, as possible. possible in range when pressing, but not to the point that it's taken away from output by just a very poor mechanically lined up position. Yep. So that's, that's the, that's the only thing that I'll do with pressing a little bit different. Just like a slightly tucked elbow press is kind of what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think the last piece I would add to all of that is wrist extension work. Bodybuilders just chronically stay in wrist flexion, whether it be curls or pulling or holding onto the bar for RDLs or deadlift variations. So pretty much everything is in active wrist flexion. And so taking it into active wrist extension is good just for like overall tissue health or elbow health and keeping that athlete in a place where they can train. Um, So I'm definitely doing that within those sessions as well, at least once a week, if not twice. Cool. Well, I think that gives everybody like some solid arm choices to pick from. I think we need to talk about how this needs to get allocated um, uh-huh. around volume, because once you're doing all these lifts proficiently, you're like, my form is solid. I'm have great effort in these. I'm not getting beat up. You probably need to do a little bit more work. If you're seeing that, Hey, these lifts are getting stronger. They're progressing. Your body weight's going up, but you're still not seeing arm size really come up as well you might just be underdoing volume which could happen so but the issue with doing more volume is that you might be in a point where your total volume is spread out everywhere to train everything but to do more arm work you're just adding more on top and you might go over what you can recover from especially if you have a lot of like pull work push work um, you might need to shift some just into arm work and reduce some in the other areas. And I think of this as like, if you had $20 to spend, this is your recovery bank and you had five days of training and you are spending $4 each day, you're going to run out of money by the end of the week. And if it's like, Oh, Hey, I need to spend a little bit more in arms. Well, damn the banks, you're bankrupt by the end of the week. So how are you going to do it? It's like, all right, well, I need to pull a dollar off a of push day, a dollar off a of pull day. So I can give those $2 to arm training 
You're still going bankrupt at the end of the week, but that's how you would shift it around to allocate more volume to arms and reduce it in the other areas to make a specialization cycle. Yep. And as you get more advanced, you'll need to do that because that volume level to stimulate enough growth, it can, can easily just be at maintenance level and going a little bit beyond it can send you past what you're able to recover from. Now, if you're earlier on, you could easily probably add some more volume in arms and not feel it, you know? So uh, it, it, it just comes down to if you're running into issues, I would say after three to four weeks of training that you feel more beat up, also, like systemically, you just feel fatigued, like less motivated to train, feel kind of brain foggy. It's probably because you're training with too much volume within this arm training you're trying to do, and you need to restructure things. Yep, I would agree 100%. Now, so I think that gets into how, how, would, we, how would we set that up then? What, what is the transition there? Yeah, so arm specialization for me is a bit interesting because the typical stereotypical, or the, sorry, the stereotypical characteristics of specialization are move that body part up in a session. Typically try to train it after a rest day because you're going to be the freshest coming into that session and then increase the frequency and the volume metrics as much as the athlete can tolerate. Typically those are like the three main characteristics you're looking at, right? With arms, I don't necessarily prioritize it after a rest day. Reason being is because the net need for output for arm training for me is so low a lot of times it's easier to program the structure of the full week when you have it going into a rest day the next day because you can run like whichever one you're prioritizing, push or pull, and then your arm day. Or you can run push with lats and arms or pull with shoulders and arms or whatever that may look like within that. So that would be the first one that I probably don't cover within arm specialization what I do really try to do is move it as far up into the session as possible, whether that looks like a solo arm day or a day that's spent mostly on arms. And then I do bring that frequency up because sessions like legs, what is it to a leg day to be able to do three or four sets of curls before you go train legs? It's not going to take away from the quality of that leg session. It's going to add volume across the week. And you can do that bicep or tricep or both. I used to do, when I was running that really specialized one, a curl and a tricep push down before I went into legs. And so that's kind of where I probably focus a lot more on the overall volume slash frequency metric and moving it as far up into a session as I can than I do actually putting it after a rest day for arm training. Okay. I I think with, with there's a a few ways to go about it. I think f for one, you need to know where you're starting at, right? Um, where your starting volume is. So what you can do is look at your current training split, count up how many work sets you have for each body part. And then from there, make like a 20% increase in arm volume. Mm -hmm. And depending on where everything else is, is going to kind of quickly allow you to see how you need to organize that across the week for a split. And, that might be like by the time what we're Luke and I are talking about, like you're should be relatively intermediate to advanced. And usually that's a lot of doing push pull legs, right? Mm -hmm. Would say like that split setup is common. The, the, I would say the, the simple way to implement this is if you have push pull legs, you're kind of rotating these throughout the week. Is that just add an arm day in and it could be before legs. So it'd be push pull arms, legs and, what would happen in turn is your push, pull, and leg work is going to get spread out because you just inserted a training day. So volume in turn is going down on those muscle groups. Then you just insert the rest days based around what you can recover from. So you could do push, pull, legs off repeat. And that could be a start. If, if you had been doing, it could have been push, pull, legs off. Maybe you were running that. So this is going to spread that, that's those sessions out. And I mean, you, you very well could make a case if you're doing, I guess, like a pull, push, legs, arms. You, you, could, you could run it like that and then off. It just usually that day after legs, most people are pretty tanked. Yeah. Which uh, arms is not a taxing session, though. That's the only thing around it. I think it's like, hey, you, you have just two options to play with for how you'd want to program it. But I also think it's really viable, too. Like if you – what your other body parts are you need – because you might not be so advanced that you can, you have to 
dial back volume on all your other areas. So maybe you do still need chest and arms or maybe it's hamstrings and arms or something. So mm. that might cater how you set that those sessions up as well. Yeah, I think that I think that's a really good way to kind of organize it. And just the amount that you put in there is relative to the amount of need. So like I've run sessions where the first rotation is push, pull, arms, legs or push, pull, legs, arms. And then the second rotation is PPL because it's not okay. quite spreading out all the sessions. So like you have push one, pull two, push one, pull one, legs, one, arms. And then you have push two, pull two, legs. So that's not like very far into specializing for arms. That's typically like the person wants an arm day for psychological reasons and they could use a little bit more arms. And so I'm, you know, keeping the client happy, but also achieving a goal at the end of the day. The further away I get from that is the more specialized the client. And that's kind of how it tends to roll. Now, I will say I really like combining arms with another body part as in just yeah. like like lats and arms is a very common one or shoulders and arms is a very common one I use where it's like, like for lats and arms, it's like five sets of lats and then you do all your arm work. It's like just enough to kind of get you over the volume metric you need for lats and then you kind of finish the arm work because it's not going to take away too much from that. Yes. No, that's, that's good. Cause so like that second session prioritizes the main things that you do need. So that's like your priority day. Mm -hmm. Right. And you could like, I like, I, I just running a setup on a couple guys. So it's, it's push, pull off. Then the next push day we do is like a delt arm day. So that used to be a regular push day spread out, but we, we had someone that has like strong chest and delts, but priorly primarily needs arm. So you could throw a lot of arm work that day. Then legs is kind of you know deprioritized. So just pull then legs again. So you only have one leg session a week. You could set it up that way. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just there's just so there's so many ways you could do this is the thing. And people want what's the right split? And it's like that's not the question. <laughs> the question is, you know, how much volume do you need for each body part and what makes sense the most on how you spread it out and organize it like that's then that's your split 100%. so the question is how much how much volume do you need to bring up arms then organize it however you need for your recovery ability and that's what you do for your split so don't uh don't just say like give me the perfect split like no no that's not the that's not the right question to be asking i think another question that's a good one to ask is how do we monitor it like how are we actually measuring that because i think making sure that that progress is happening is an important aspect of it and I like measurements relative to body fat percentage. I know a lot of people don't. So that's where you like have to just go off visuals. But I think for me, the measurements relative to body fat percentage is probably the most accurate one to use. Yeah, the visuals are just, it's very subjective. And uh, I mean, I have visuals back like when I, I, ha I moved so now my like lighting and my setup changed. So how do I compare to that? I mean, that's, is what matters at the end of the day, like how it looks on stage. But I, I still think you can do some of both. Like it's easy to do an arm measurement and mm. at least have something kind of a little bit more objective to go off of. It's just don't measure it so, so frequently because it's going <laughs> to be slow moving. Yeah. So, I mean, usually you're having to like, you're probably gonna have to see like 10 pound body weight shifts before you're seeing like meaningful changes measurement wise in the arms. And so it might be you measuring this, you know, maybe every, every two months or something and just tracking it making sure it's trending up. Cause I've had guys where we do track it and across like three months, like body weights moving up, but our arms aren't. So it's like, okay, it very well should be since we've added like 20 pounds on, uh, <laughs> we need to, we need to restructure, this program and then we're kind of dialing in what this person really needs volume wise to to bring up that muscle group yeah i really like the relative to body fat percentage with clients i work with because i know for my case like when i would diet down my arms would look way better than they actually did in the off season and i have a couple clients that are that way as well and so like for people who work with you for a longer time period if you just collect that data like measurement relative to body fat percentage with your calipers 
and then you just kind of stack that up every two or three months, you kind of see that trend for that athlete relative to a longer period of time. I mean, I guess you want to get like really nerdy about it. You could do like a, a tricep and bicep skin fold and then an arm measurement <laughs> and then compare the, compare those back. No, I don't think most people, I don't do that, uh-uh. but I, I think, yeah, just looking at the arm measurement, looking at body weight and looking at the visuals yeah. could, could, could be, be enough alone with that, which is that. Absolutely. I think, is there anything else that you would add to specializing for arms as far as like things that the audience needs to take away for actually doing this? Uh, I, I, I mean, I think it would come up like about uh, loading and rep, rep ranges. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a and good a, one. Yeah, and, and just like, because a lot of times you go to arm work and then it gets into doing more uh, like set extender, you know, beyond, you know, uh, hyperemic kind of like pump type work. And mm-hmm. it, it's still like, and Luke and I, we talked about this in about, you know, our, our podcast we did with, heavyweights for lovers, lightweights. And, you know, the in, in outcome here is that, you know, still the, the rep range that works really well for hypertrophy, it's still going to fall between like eight to 15 reps. Uh, so as long as you're within that, um, that would be pretty much the money rep range to work in where it kind of dictates which rep to work, rep range to work in is really down to the exercise and what you're able to connect with and safely perform. Mm. so like maybe your initial tricep extension you're like yeah my elbows feel a little shitty doing that for eight reps it's like well you start with that for 15 then maybe on your overhead uh, you know tricep extension then you can move it down to like eight to ten reps um i still really like like doing more of a, a heavier set first then dropping back into lighter sets but the rep range just shifts around based on what i'm able to do so it doesn't have to be an eight eight rep then to a 12 rep it could be the 12 rep to a 15 rep or a 15 to even a 20 sometimes. Yeah. But I also would say that we want high quality sets and I would have the primary amount of your work being straight sets with two minute rest periods. So you're fresh for this next set and not just turning your arm work into like circuit training or short rest intervals with drop sets and supersets because you're just going to be doing lower quality st- stimulating volume. Yeah. So not that it, it can't be there. Like there, there is an aspect that very well could drive some extra hypertrophy, but it shouldn't solely be based around that. Agreed. 100%. And honestly, wouldn't change a thing about what you just said. Cause that's exactly how I explain it to my clients. Right on. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll wrap it up there then. Yep. <laughs> Any other questions around arm training? Well, I would highly recommend you join Luke and I for the <laughs> Applied Hypertrophy Optimization course. So Luke and I made this course just take you in the gym, show you exactly what we talked about today where we assess how to, how to assess someone for what they mechanically can do, mm-hmm. how to set them up into all these exercises. Then we run through like our top picks of lifts to do and variations if you can't do them. And we even give you some program designs around bringing up arms or back or chest or hit anything that you, you wanted to. And even an exercise index that lists all the cues. And so there's a, a ton of value there if you're looking to train and improve for hypertrophy outcomes. We'll leave it down in the description below for everyone to check out. If you have other questions, also leave it down below and we will talk to you next time.